Hey. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> My name is Anne Hazels, and I'm the director of Radius Gallery. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to be doing an artist talk um, within the exhibition uh, called From a Whale's Back with the artist and um, who is featured here today. I want to give a little bit of background first about Radius Gallery and then also where we are. Um, year round, we show contemporary art exhibitions and my kind of background is actually, is actually um, installation art and I'm really inspired by landscape work and actually totally immersive pieces, um, which is what connected us. And um, this exhibit that we are in right now, it's actually funded through Ebb and Flow, which is with the Arts Council of Santa Cruz County. They funded the exhibition along with many other projects. And this is the sixth year of this project. And it was pretty, it's a pretty powerful project um, partnered with the Coastal Watershed Council and the city of Santa Cruz to actually get people to educate themselves about our water and the river and how to use this beautiful space that we have and how to live within an ecology and the environment, and how to take care of our environment better. I was particularly interested in this exhibition with Yolandi because um, it really pairs art and science. And I think the more we have these conversations with art and science, that the better we educate ourselves and the more we can create change. And I feel like it's our job right now to really put this forward for the next generation and how to create change in policy and also make the world better. That's our hope. Um, so specifically about this exhibition from a whale's back, um, there's this idea about interconnectedness and we'll hear about that a lot more, but for Radius Gallery and also Ebb and Flow, there's this connection where our gallery doors were located here in Santa Cruz, California, this beautiful town that we live in, in Northern California, right on the coast. And the San Lorenzo River is literally 100 yards away from our gallery door here. We are so very fortunate to have this beautiful water space right outside that we get to look at. And from the San Lorenzo River, it flows into the Monterey Bay and then flows into the Pacific Ocean, which then leads us to this vast, beautiful work um, that we have access to through Yolendi and the artist, excuse me, the scientists that she's been working with. So I'd like to introduce our artist here, and if you can give us a little bit of background about yourself and your work. Yes, thank you, Anne. Um, and thank you for having the courage to take me and my work on in the Radius Gallery. I've been here so many times for um, your exhibitions and the events that go on here in Santa Cruz. And I've always liked this space in itself, um, the intimacy of it and um, its kind of flexibility and something about the, the feel of the kind of, um, I don't know, upside downness of this building. Yeah, I keep looking up. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that, fe that felt to me that um, it, it connected to this uh, underwater ocean. Mm -hmm. So I, my work has been involved with the em environment for a long time. And I've been increasingly focused over the last uh, 10 years or so on spaces that we can't access as um, you know normal human beings. Um, whether they are spaces that are too small, too large, too uh, beyond our sensorium to access them. So one of the big um, areas that I've looked at is and listened to is the uh, underwater world. Um, underwater is less predominantly visual than sonic. So um, the idea being that if we listen and learn to listen in those deep ocean spaces, then um, we can have a little more understanding and access to those places than, than otherwise. So my work is very much involved with sound, with listening, with the environment, and with um, ways of connection between ourselves as humans and between other species and other um, ecosystems. So interconnectedness is one of the big, big themes, yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that you bring up uh, listening because I, I think with everything going on in the world today, it's 
what we should all be doing more of, right? You know, whether it's in our own circles or worldwide, you know, with everything going on. There's so much with this social change and activism and how to make it more peaceful. It is about listening, right? And I think when we look at work like this, it, it automatically softens us in a way when we see the when we see the water in these little bubbles and so it does create this feeling of like slowing down and taking the time to listen you know i really i really appreciate that and i i feel like we all need more of that you know your artwork it has this amazing quality of doing two things at once so I feel like there's this vastness you know you're you're we're out in the ocean you know swimming projected behind us you know we're in Antarctica and we're swimming with orcas and mink whales and um what's the third species the humpback humpback, yeah, humpback, humpback whales, whales. This one here. no problem Could, do you mind to go around thank you um so we're, there's this vastness of being in the ocean, but it's also quite intimate, you know, where when I first saw this little clips of, of the video that you were working with, it felt so p deeply personal and it felt almost maternal. It felt like I, this mama whale is taking me for a ride on her back. Um, but I think your work, it has this dual quality also in other pieces that you've done where you may be in a very urban setting, but you're playing something that it's about nature. You know, it's this contrast, right? Two different things going on. I'm wondering if you can speak to this a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think that we can empathize with things more greatly if we are intimately experiencing them mm. in a very general sense you know that can, that can be for from many different circumstances that we get into so i think intimacy is is important to have a sense of closeness um is part of a sense of connectedness mm -hmm. to people but you know how do you actually achieve that especially when you're using things like projected images projected light um sound that is in right. the gallery space so yeah. so um working on on trying to achieve that that quality of closeness with this um vastness as you say and distance re how to bring those uh, re remote places closer to us because if if we can do that then i think we can have the potential to get more empathetic towards them and mm -hmm. understand them better and i think that's the first step mm -hmm. so um so listening is is crucial to that and mm -hmm. like you say listening is a mode of behaving and being in the world that um we can all work with on many different levels and uh, you know it's a constant practice to do it better mm -hmm. uh, in different circumstances so um you know, I know I'm not the expert in many forms of listening, although I do listen to all sorts of things a lot and I can see the kind of quality that it can bring about. Sure. Um, so, so yeah, so listening is important. I mean, in this exhibition, there's more, uh, you, you, you're taken by the video, by the image. Mm -hmm. So the sound has another level um, of engagement to it but mm -hmm. one other thing you said that i that i wanted to comment on Anne, was um softness mm. you mentioned this word softness and i and i um i think that's an important quality and i haven't really used that word very much in my work but i i, I like it and i know uh, i know kind of where it could come from and come in so so um softness and you said kind of slowing down i think that's also mm -hmm. um part of it um yeah if this can be a space where people can enter into a moment of that mm -hmm. then that's mm -hmm. that's good can we talk a little bit about the sound piece so for those of you listening in right now um you may hear uh snippets of sound coming in but there's an incredible soundtrack that goes with each of these four videos that it has um, sounds from the whale tags which we'll get to in a moment with that but then you've also composed music on top of this and can you talk a little bit about that 
process because I are you responding to what you see here you know the, the music can ramp up and you know the, the whales are charging they're moving so quickly through the water I mean I think they travel up to almost 30 miles an hour or something and your music is often kind of ramping up as in the same way as if you're responding or do you work very differently is it two things that kind of pair nicely at the end or maybe it's a combination always so curious about the artist process yeah, so um, I, I work differently in different, in different circumstances, but with this piece, so this is made up of um, four different videos that I selected from, you know, reams of, of videos that I was given from the scientist who's collected them, and I ended up with, with four, and they're each about five minutes long, and so the whole cycle in here is about 20 minutes, and some of them had the most extraordinary sound. So the one with the orcas that we w might get around to seeing at some point, um, the orcas actually are swimming. Sometimes I can see four animals in one screen. There may be more off to the other side because we can't see that side. And they're making constant sound amongst themselves. Mm. So that was um, kind of important to me to, to see how close they how closely they swim together at high speed and the, how there's constant sound going back and forth between them. So I, you know, I, I kept that as part of the sound and I didn't add any music on top of that. So that mm. kind of is propelling that piece. Um, this piece here, the one you're seeing now, mm -hmm. is you hear a lot of the microphone banging into ice. <laughs> Oh, wow. So it's the, you, the environment. So we actually can hear the, what's happening in the environment there. So you hear not only the ice itself, but you hear the technology mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of it hitting the microphone. It's hitting the, it's hitting the tag. So you're aware somehow of the presence of this technology, that it, it, it is this artificial viewpoint that we have, mm -hmm. um, which I think is really important. And here you see... Um, you can see the minke whale uh, just surfacing through all this ice. You can see its back and then a glimpse of its blowhole mm -hmm. as it breathes. It might be behind my back to the viewers. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I see it. Yeah. Yeah. So those sounds were really important. You hear their blowhole. They were mm -hmm. really important to keep. But I, um, I wanted something extra to kind of propel. And, and I find that the music kind of sets it up a notch. It's it. it brings your focus in slightly differently. Sure. Um, so in that piece, I added the sounds to it. And they were sounds that I had made separately. So, um, and then found them to go with this piece. Mm -hmm. So that's the harp that this piece fitted in. This example here, these are um, humpback whales, a group of them, and they end up swimming through a shoal of jellyfish, um, which you'll see in a moment. Um, Lovely. And like the, the quality of this image, and, and all of them really, is that you don't see any distance. You see this, um, this kind of blurry, murky distance. Only when something comes really close do you get any focus of what it really is. So these, you'll see these jellyfish kind of come out of the screen at you. Mm -hmm. Um, they sort of emerge from something and you know that there's vastness beyond that mm -hmm. but you're never getting further and when you know that whales and the sounds that they use travel the sounds travel so far in the mm -hmm. ocean then you start to realize the difference between you know our vision and the use of sound in the ocean so those those things were there and then but with this one I used a, um, a piece that I had worked with improvising with a, a two other musicians, um, Kristen um, Erickson and Madison Hying. And this section of what we were working with, so um, theremin and synth and harp and electronics, seemed to me to fit with this. Mm -hmm. And there's some kind of locking that comes in. I try all sorts of different pieces and most of it doesn't work, but then at some point one will and it just kind of locks in and it creates this kind of suspense of um, attention mm -hmm. to the piece. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, so th I, I treat it differently. Yeah, yeah thanks. Here come the jellyfish, they're just starting. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. So with installation art, what I, respond to 
I love, I'll go on the record, I love all art forms. I respond so deeply to installation art because there, I have a response. So many of my senses feel the install, it's absolutely immersive. You know, it's much different than if, if I'm just listening to a story or a poet reading versus if I'm just standing in front of a painting. You know, I feel like with an installation such as this one where it's, it's our sight, it's our senses, it, we absolutely feel temperature when we come into this installation. One, it's the water, you know, we're, we're, we're in the water. You also made very deliberate design decisions with the space of keeping, you know, the, the gallery space. It does run cool in here, but it's a, it's a visually cold floor. Mm -hmm and it's concrete and then you responded originally to the the beams in this space and this is a historic building it's you know the tannery art center or excuse me the Saul's tannery was in operation for 146 years so i think about all of the stories that that go with this all of the feet and hands that have touched this ground and these beams and when you walked into this space on one of your first site visits you mentioned a boat and that stayed with me because it can I feel like it connects to the ocean work that you do you know the scientist is out on a boat doing this research and you're delivered with these this data this visual data that you can work with and so can you talk a little bit about um, a boat and this kind of symbolic piece for you uh, yes so you know, working, working with whales, um, it is one of the most loaded symbols that you can work with. And uh, it, it, it's sometimes a struggle to have people, you know, get beyond, oh, not whales again, or, oh, whales, or whatever, the, you know, whatever the reaction <laughs> the glee, is, and, the, right. and that they're carrying with them, because, because, I mean, the whales were taken in the 70s as a symbol of, of um, you know the environmental movement, so they're very significant. Their their sure. their symbolism is taken and used right. in multiple different ways. So um, you know I'm very aware of that. Uh, the 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 space here, you know, the reflections on the floor are important. So mm -hmm. the the image is not just projected um, so that it fits on the wall. It actually spills on the floor and it spills up into the rafters. So it's kind of it, it, in filling that space more and sort of overflowing from the way you might expect the walls, that's important. Um, and um, the boat, well, let's perhaps let's start with the tannery because I learned just the other day that, um, well, I know that this is the tannery where the cattle were brought in to create the hides. Um, I understand that there was also a slaughterhouse nearby or perhaps here. There, the cattle never <laughs> lived here. They, right. The cattle were never here. The hides were delivered. But delivered. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I understood that they they were the cattle were brought nearby and then. Mm, okay. Yeah, so so I mean just the 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 I mean I'm very interested in historic buildings and the memory that they contain, oh, sure. that they hold, and to know that this is a place of large mammals, large land mammals, suddenly uh, you know fills me with like ah oh, okay. And now it's filled with whales. Yeah. Okay, it's not filled with whales. It's filled with images of whales. Remember, right. but um, there's a presence and a quality of the the image that that can imaginatively take you there. So, uh -huh. so that's part of it. And you know, the boat, I do see still an upside down boat, and I have many connections with boats and sailing for mm -hmm. you know, for my life and mm. generations and. Um, I have a feeling also with this kind of structure and this kind of boat that it, um, oh, well, it's, it's hard to say, but um, I'm thinking of the immigrant boats that cross from Africa into Europe and um, the kind of structures that they are and how many people fit into them. Right. And how you know they're they're collected? They're often wrecked after they've delivered people, and they wash up on beaches. Um, mm -hmm. And there's something very powerful in in a boat as a container of 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 people, of memories, and of a, um, something that travels distance. Right. So um, that sense of connectedness, I think, I, I, this may be kind of far 
far appear far from the whales, but I think it's an important sort of piece in a way. Yeah. Well, there's so much history. That's probably a, another artist talk. Yeah. Um, but with with whaling in general, and I I would imagine in working with this body of work and this species that there the that part of the history and the hardship of history and the environmental movements are really at the forefront of how you work and how you create and really what you're bringing you're using this platform to continue this conversation yes and this is where i think um the talk with uh, the scientists in a couple of weeks will will help a lot because to understand the impact of the whaling history mm -hmm. on these species and how they're recovering mm -hmm. um, is is just it, it's so it's so fascinating and so important to what what we're seeing in terms of interconnectedness so the, uh, the whale is a um, that species is a it's a very um, long-lived animal mm -hmm. so it covers a long a long time span of hi sure. of our history so um that in itself is interesting and of environmental history and change and ecological change so mm -hmm. in that sense it's very important too mm -hmm. and there's another one other connection with the boat and the whaling is that these videos are taken from these um tags that they place on the backs of the whales and when you watch them do it they're in a small boat and they're g going up with a, a long pole with this tag on the end. Yeah. And it looks a little bit like uh, a modern day harpooner. You know? Oh, really? Well, they, they, they follow the whales wow. for a long time, yes. directing them. So they're, they're chasing with the whales and waiting until they surface. They can see them just below the surface. Uh -huh. And as they surface, then they'll pop. If they're in the right position, they'll put the tag on. Uh -huh. So it's um, and in extreme conditions in the Antarctic and right. places. So there is, a, there is a sort of memory there of, of the harpoonists and the whalers. And, um, sure. So have you been on one of the boats to witness this with the way you've seen? The no, videos? I haven't. I've okay. seen their yes. videos. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the connection with the scientists that you were able to get this data from, can you give us a little bit of background on that? And did you present this idea that I've been I, I'm dreaming of these ocean videos? Do you have them? And did it, it your, all your wishes just get answered mm -hmm. or had you all been working specifically on certain types of data or maybe you wanted the jellies or you know certain things that you were looking for in there or was it just happenstance that there's this you're at UCSC and this you know he, the behavioral scientist is also up at UCSC and so it's a wealth of research happening right in our very town yeah and I did want to to do something local with the researchers who are here because we are on the Monterey Bay and it is a huge resource for for marine science so so that was mm -hmm. a conscious decision um i've been working with uh, on a previous project called melt me into the ocean and that was really concentrating on the sound part mm -hmm. and working with local scientists who would bring um high quality high resolution sound from deep in the in the canyon so that was part of it but what i really wanted after doing that was to have something sound or video or some data from a moving source so not from a fixed hydrophone a fixed um a fixed observatory but something that is moving and and i was became really interested in um these tags and tagging technology and it's something that i've looked at looked into with other animals uh, and birds and things but um when i looked further into it and found that ari friedlander was working here and was the one who'd been developing the technology and gathering all this data wow. that I contacted him, not really knowing the state of what the data that he was bringing in. Um, and then when he uh, very openly shared with me the videos that he'd taken and these highlights of the videos, I was like, this is incredible. Mm -hmm. And one of the th one of the things about the videos is that they're not super high quality. They are high quality, but there are all sorts of graininess in them. Um, there are glitches and jerks in the video. Um, the same with the sound. There's a lot of distortion. And uh, sometimes the colors are off. There's a ring around the edge, like a halo 
when and and you know there are all sorts of details like that when you come up out of the you break the surface and go back down and you have these, these reflections of the tag like bright orange suddenly wow so these these um the video itself is not what you would expect of these beautiful um, kind of Hawaiian uh, swimming with the humpback whale videos, mm -hmm. high mm -hmm. high resolution, very dreamy kind of um, pristine image. It's not mm -hmm. like that at all. It's mm -hmm. really gritty and kind of mm -hmm. um, uh, got this quality of just being there in this murky water and doing these things. So that was just amazing to work with him with that. Yeah. Just fantastic. If, if I may jump in though, just on that note with the, the video quality and actually using the tag you name the show based kind of based on this right where it's from a whale's back where you have this feeling of you know we, when we all think of the whale's back it's this beautiful elongated arch you know it's vast it's massive it's much like our ocean you know but it it does have this quality and so when we're looking at video where it actually reveals this is a perfect part where it's doing it, it is revealing the perspective from a whale's back. You know, this is how they move. Yeah, these are shoals of fish that they are um, bubble net feeding with. So they're creating these bubbles. They dive very deep as it goes dark, you see, and then make a ring of bubbles around the fish, the shoals of fish, and then come up. And um, you really see this behavior through this, video and you write on on the on the back and there's this there are a couple of things one is that um you, you kind of have the perspective of the whale you do mm -hmm. kind of have that mm -hmm. uh, but on another level you don't at all because we're just a little tiny blip of a camera and a microphone and some data collecting mm -hmm. sitting on the back of this enormous animal mm -hmm. uh, and and so to think that we have the same kind of sensorium as them or experience looking through this little portal of course is not right at all right that's not happening but we get a i think of it as a glimpse and here where we go through the surface yeah those bits to me are um really important because you know we're land breathing animals and when you come up you kind of get a breath of <gasps> of right. our sort of air land, you know, yes. air, and, and you can see a distance. You suddenly see the distance and you recognize it. And right. then when you dive down, you're in, in this other, the, yes. this world of, of the underwater, which is, you know, it's so close, but it's, um, yeah. Yeah. it's you, that boundary. Kind you of brought up um, Melt Me Into the Ocean, which is a project that you've been working on for two or three years at this point, but I first saw it presented with Indexical, which is an incredible organization here in Santa Cruz, but they do contemporary sound work that they actually do a lot of broadcasting that way. But I went to this piece that you performed last year when they were had the whole series of the shows and we met on the beach and then walked through um, with the soundtrack, listening to the soundtrack and having that response. And so, you had this idea of kind of reactivating this during this exhibition. Can you talk a little bit about um, kind of round two of Melt Me Into the Ocean with Santa Cruz and how this has now become kind of a, a worldwide experience because we have opportunity to do it virtually at this point, right? Yes, of course. You know, uh, <laughs> this exhibition has taken a lot longer than we'd hoped to open for other reasons <laughs> last year, last summer it was supposed to open and then yeah. it was postponed until until now and, you know, we, we're, we're going through it. So the opportunity to do it online and, and, and more globally is really good. Uh, Melt Me Into the Ocean has gone from Santa Cruz, which was really its initial site, so that the sounds were from the ocean that you looked at. Oh, okay. So, you know, walking along the beaches there and by the lighthouse was actually looking out into the very place that the sounds are from. And the sound, again, was with a hydrophone in the water, or is it an external microphone or both? No, it was all underwater, underwater. sounds from hydrophones from um, close to the shore and then deep down in the canyon from... Um, a, a moored hydrophone very deep down. Oh, wow. From the Mbari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute's hydrophone. So um, they were 
the sounds that we were listening to. So it was kind of like an extended sight, an, an experience of your body walking along that coast and then listening to these sounds and it kind of t took you down and out into the bay in mm -hmm. that way. But then I've taken those sounds much further mm -hmm. um, to other places. I've taken them to um, Nebraska, downtown Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska, um, to a festival there. I've um, taken them to the south coast of England and to um, Flagstaff, Arizona, all around Roden Crater, James Terrell's Roden Crater, work, so to, to the desert, to high desert. Yeah. Um, and it, it, they're, they're so portable, these sounds and these headphones, I'm really um, interested in how they um, activate your sense of space and place in those in those other environments that um, you're kind of uh, smashing them together in a way or overlaying them on on your experience and if it extends your experience of that space or does something else. So mm -hmm. I think of them as, uh, I, I, I do think of it as both site specific and then portable kind of um, something that you can, so remote and then um, overlaid in a way in other spaces to see mm -hmm. how it, how it activates your sense of yeah. global interconnectedness like a larger scale of interconnectedness you, while in a in a space yeah you immediately responded when when everything when we it was shelter in place starting in march and you were kind of in the height of your editing really and with the the sound and also the video and then you know we were having this moment of okay it, at what point do we open and how do we open? But you immediately responded to this piece of the, the remote bit. And I think it's, it probably stemmed from, well, you've done this with, you know, melt me into the ocean and it had gone to the desert and, you know, other parts of the Americas. And you were able to apply that here. You ended up creating this website that features all four of the videos with the sound components on your site. And so it's, it does become a worldwide experience where you're speaking of this interconnectedness and remoteness that it has or that it can have yeah i i i want people to be able to experience it mm -hmm. and we can't we can't go to these places any more than many people can come to this specific radius gallery space mm -hmm. um so you how do, how do you deal with the, that contradiction of you know access to these ideas and these these yeah, spaces um and, you know, we're in a time when we can't travel. Even when we need to travel, we can't travel. Yeah. And yet there's a, there can still be a closeness and, a, mm -hmm. and an intimacy across distance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, I want to thank you for that, such a powerful, majestic, and important exhibition. I think the more we pair art and science together the further along we all are and being better humans and taking care of our land and our oceans and the air um, as well so um, I'm going to close our talk again with uh, thanking um, Arts Council Santa Cruz County and uh, with the Ebb and Flow Festival for funding this exhibition. It's going to be up through all of July and we're able to have visitors in here, just a select few. It's 1,900 square feet within the gallery space, so we're asking, um, there's still a face covering requirement when you are under that six feet, um, when you're not able to social distance, you should wear a face covering when you do come to the space. Um, there are several events still planned um, that we have with the exhibition, the sonic walks that we're doing at sunset and then also in the morning, and you can check the Radius website for that information, which is radius.gallery. Um, and also, I would love to thank um, the scientists, uh, Ari Friedlander, um, and also the musicians, if you can just say their names again to thank okay. them for being a part of this exhibition. Yeah, Christian Erickson and Madison Hying. Awesome. Thank you so much and enjoy the afternoon and we look forward to seeing you here at Radius. <laughs>